as we always do whenever the anniversary falls on a day that we are on air, we, we talk about D-Day, we talk about the some of the historical aspects maybe that you were unaware of, uh, some of the amazing stories. And then, of course, we have to talk about the news of the day as well, which we will do. Do you know that it was almost... First off, D-Day was disastrous. It was up against disastrous odds, insurmountable odds. The landings, and it's hard to say it, but it's the reality. Part of it was to be a war of attrition. To be wave after wave after wave after wave after wave of troops coming in to overwhelm the Germans that were there on the cliffs. And it almost was a disaster because of the weather. This is an interesting story. There was a short gap. They had a storm on June 5th, and there was, looked like it was going to be maybe a storm coming after, and there was just a partial break in the cloud cover that allowed for this to happen. Eisenhower was forced to delay it by 24 hours because of the storm. It was going to hit the channel on June 5th. They had a break off of the coast of Ireland's County Mayo. And the story of this is interesting. Maureen Flavin, she's called Sweeney. Uh, she ended up being honored by our own government because her weather report saved thousands of lives. She passed away last year. They had 1,200 warships getting ready to go. Everything was planned for June 5th. Every single aspect of the invasion required a certain weather condition to be successful. You didn't want crazy stormy water there in the channel. You didn't want cloud cover that prevented our aerial support from protecting what was happening on the ground. Uh, they needed calm seas. Calm seas. They needed a, a low tide. You had uh, 4,000. It was over 4,000. I can't remember the exact number. Over 4,000 landing craft. Crazy, crazy. The largest milit the largest seaborne invasion in the history of this planet. So you had the deception that we talked about last hour that made the Germans think, and not just not just on D-Day, but even after, that saved lives. But you had this Martine Flavin, and she lived in, in Ireland. And the story of her, she was, uh, she was a postmistress or a deputy postmistress. And she was watching overnight. She had the overnight shift on June 3rd. And it was her 21st birthday, Maureen Flavin. And she was doing some of the readings of the weather. And she saw that the, what was going on with the waves and the force, uh, six winds, she said, that were capable of whipping up 11-foot high waves. It was coming in from the Atlantic. She saw what was, hit, what, was, what was hitting her, where she was, her location in County Mayo. And so she was sharing details. She ended up uh, reporting what she was experiencing. She was... Uh, peppered with calls about her work from a woman with an English accent. She was asked to repeat her readings. Her readings were passed unbeknownst to her to London. She was relaying the information to Irish meteorological services as well in Dublin. And uh, she had been married to the local lighthouse keeper, Ted Sweeney. She rode to Black Sod Bay's lighthouse. They were looking at uh, other meteorological instruments relaying this to the Irish government. And what, why they were doing that is because whatever was happening in County Mayo, that was an indication of what was going to be going into the channel in about anywhere from, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And so she saved lives because she said, wait, 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 this is some real bad weather coming in June 5th, guys. Wait, 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 this is what's happening right now to County Mayo. Wait, 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 wait. And she also was in contact with them, uh, according to uh, the historians and the documents and everything at the time. There was an unreleased note from Eisenhower that was talking about the landings. They were waiting for uh, a break in the weather to get a satisfactory foothold, et cetera, et cetera. And, I mean, it was a very high-risk, high-reward play here. And uh, they knew that even though the weather wasn't totally perfect on June 6th, it was partial cloud cover. There was a break in the storms, a 24-hour break. That was going to give them enough time. 
So just that, I mean, just a little window of time. 21-year-old postmistress who just was there and was, was tasked with watching what was coming in. This is unbelievable. Just every part, every person played a role. And I want to talk real quick, and we're going to get into the news of the day. I want to talk about the actual true equality of Patton because we, here it's Alphabet Month. D-Day gets a day. And what the men and even the women did on D-Day, what was done on D-Day, that is fighting for rights. That is a struggle. That is, is true inspiration. Everything else, all this other stuff with the alphabet stuff is nonsense. It's noise. If one of my favorite, and again, I share it every year because I think it's honestly the best speech ever. I can't read all of it on air. Uh, Patton noted that he did not speak. Uh, he said, it. how did he say? It's not polite for tea rooms, maybe. I think is what is how he put it. Uh and even for the movie, on his life, they sanitized it. But he spoke how the troops needed to, he spoke what they needed to hear. And I love, I have the full speech. It's, I, I read it, but it's very long. I have the full speech. But I love this aspect of it. Because he was talking about all of the people involved in this, the teamwork. He said, every single man in this army, this is from his speech, plays a vital role. Don't ever let up. Don't think that your job is unimportant. Every man, Patton said, has a job to do and he must do it. Every man is a vital link in the great chain. What if every truck driver suddenly decided he didn't like the whine of those shells overhead, turned yellow and jumped headlong into a ditch? He says, that cowardly, well, redacted, could say, hell, they won't miss me, just one man in thousands. But what if every man thought that way? Where in the hell would we be now? Where would our country, our loved ones, our homes, even the world be like? He says, no, damn it, Americans don't think like that. Every man does his job. Every man serves the whole. He talked about the ordnance men and supplying the guns and the machinery, the quartermaster, bringing up food and clothes because he goes, where we're going, there isn't a hell of a lot to steal. He said, every last man on KP has a job to do, even the one who heats our water to keep us from getting the GI runs. But that's not what he said. And he said this, he goes, every man must not only think of himself, but also of his buddy fighting beside him. He said, we don't want yellow cowards in this army. He said that they should be killed off like flies. And if not, they'll go back home after the war, the cowards and breed more cowards. And the brave men will breed more brave men. But he talked about every link in the chain pulling together. He goes, and then that makes the chain unbreakable. He, that's equality. What Patton talked about, that was true equality. None of this sex flag and military men in heels, in uniform, nonsense. This is equality of purpose. It's equality of battle. It is equality of teamwork. Real, actual equality. True equality equality, lasting equality. If it didn't strengthen the whole, then it's a distraction. And distractions, well, those are the enemy's tricks. And that was Patton's equality. You were there for the unifying mission of purpose. You were there because you are fighting an evil that you need others to help you defeat. Every single person plays a role. We've lost that. We've lost it a lot in politics. No one thinks like that. Everybody wants to go out for the golden ring because they don't appreciate all of the other roles enough. We don't have enough encouragers. That's a very powerful, I think, calling to have is to be an encourager. That's just as important as being the person who gets the golden ring. And Patton recognized all of this. He recognized every bit of it. We don't have Pattons anymore. It's depressing. Maybe we do. Maybe they're coming. What does it say? Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Well, we're not in good times right now. 
So what type of man are you raising? And that includes women.